After being postponed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, All Toyota Fest returned to Marina Green Park in Long Beach, California for its 25th anniversary in 2021. Though stringent health and safety guidelines were in place for this live, in-person event, that didn't dampen the festive spirit of this Toyota family reunion. To each and every exhibitor, spectator, sponsor, and vendor that participated this year, we give our heartfelt thanks for making All Toyota Fest's return a success. Our morning started early, as our dedicated team of volunteers led all 450 registered cars to their designated spots on the show field. All Toyota Fest absolutely could not happen without the support of these volunteers, and we send them our heartfelt thanks for their hard work and enthusiasm. Today in Torque Digital, we're going to show you even more amazing cars, as well as Toyota USA's never-before-seen inside story, created specially for Torque. And we'll be bringing you a nostalgic selection of vintage Toyota television commercials. Hi, I'm uh, Georgie Lewis. I live in Redondo Beach, California. Okay, what we have here is a 1982 Toyota Soar. This is uh, Toyota's uh, first uh, attempt on the luxury GT uh, class. This particular model won uh, Car of the Year 1981 and 82 in Japan. Some uh, nice things about this car would be uh, it's got a digital dash. It's got a it's got a computerized uh, climate control. So it's got a CRT push button. That was the first time. It's got a speed alarm, which is pretty cool. You basically adjust the speed 
and it'll it'll buzz when it gets there. So that was pretty cool too. Um, I've been a member of Torque since uh, basically started, uh, so about 24, 25 years now. And uh, we first uh, started to meet uh, down in San Diego for about maybe 15, 20 cars. Then every year it would uh, increase double. And uh, closer to 99, maybe 2000, we moved up to uh, the Queen Mary uh, parking lot just the parking lot right in front of the boat there was maybe about 40 50 cars by then following years we had to move to the grass to get a little bit more room for the cars we uh we stayed there probably till maybe three four years ago since uh queen mary in the parking just couldn't handle the crowd at 10 o'clock it was maxed out so we had to move out to marina which was a lot better um torque is basically uh uh, like a family reunion when we have the Toyota Fest so it's really not about car shows it's about people friends um, basically it's it's a family event you know and um, there's really more of um, more of a sharing stories on how you got involved into Toyota so that way we can at least pass this on, you know, this hobby to the next generation. Toyota Fest is actually uh, an appreciation of uh, the heritage of what Toyota did. And uh, we wanted to preserve that. So we would always uh, look into how the owner is involved with the car, how the car helped him out, you know, how it was good for the family and um, basically how good the cars are. So going back to having old cars, you know, it just brings back those memories. Like you go to the Toyota Fest, you'll see from a very bone stock old car that people really appreciate more than the newer flashier cars. So it's not really more of a car show, but really a family reunion, you know, just kind of share the hobby with other families. I bought this uh, back in 88, so I've owned it uh, a little bit over 30, maybe 33 years now. It's been uh, uh, restored once, at least once over on the paint. Uh, motor's been uh, redone to get emissions. It, it was federalized in um, 80, about 85 when it was brought in. So I'm basically the second owner of this car. When the first owner had it, he had it uh, turbocharged and stroked to a three liter. And uh, when I got it, I had to do all the bar certification to get it all smog legal. So we had to undo the turbo, but I kept the, the stroker that keeps it at 3.0. So it's pretty torquey. It's got basically a Gen 2 Supra suspension. McPherson in the front, independent rear, and independent rear, four-wheel disc. They called it a super luxury GT back then, and um, it was very popular to the younger executives in Japan because that was like the car to have. So basically, the Soarer now is the Lexus SC series. So that's just one of the higher end of the models. Okay, to get this car legally uh, entered as a gray market back in the uh, early, mid 80s, a few things had to be done. Uh, basically, the mirrors couldn't be on the fender, so we actually had to put the mirrors here. And uh, there was a model that actually had them, so you can actually see some other marks from the old mirror. We also had to do uh, the lights, the side marker lights had to be done too. Then inside the door, you had to add reinforcement. On the dash, on the digital dash, it was in kilometers. So to get it legal, it has to be changed to a mile per hour. So those are little things. Then on the, on the gas filler, you also had to add that anti-spill. So that was another thing that had to be done. Same with the side markers in the rear, that was uh, done too. That's to get him legally registered, federalized car. 
so it's actually all legal. And this is actually the only known first-gen sorter that exists in the U.S. It's cars that you keep, you know, there's a special, special meaning to it, having been the only one. Yeah, and uh, I use it like maybe two, three times a year. <laughs> That's it, you know. Just to kind of keep it restored and running, you know, keep its heritage, pretty much keep it as stock as possible. And uh, that's, uh, that was the whole thing. Toyota Celica ST. It was especially modified for racing. But you can buy one a lot like it. Both have an overhead cam engine. Both have McPherson strut front suspension. Both have four on the floor. Both have a tachometer. The Toyota Celica ST. A lot of car for the money. See it at your Toyota dealer. See how much car your money can buy. Statistics. Speed, 87 miles an hour. Mileage, 30 to the gallon. Chassis lubrication, never. And the two-door price is just $16.86. Come the new one from Toyota. Check the shape the statistics. Just $16.86. And Well, the Toyota 86 is definitely one of my favorite, if not my favorite car in the Toyota lineup. And uh, as a Scion racer, when we got out of the TCs, they gave us the predecessor, which was the FRS. And like so many times, as we take in a new car, we start getting used to it, trying to understand what its strengths and weaknesses are, and what we can do to make it better. It wouldn't be DG spec if we didn't do that. So when we were on the dyno, we did a baseline test to see how much power the stock configuration was making. And we decided to do a few different tests. And one of the tests we did is pull the rear exhaust section off where the mufflers were. And it was actually really pleasant sounding, not annoying, not like, oh my God, it's so loud, we can't ever drive like this. And we saw some horsepower there. So we took that rear section, stuffed it in the trunk, proceeded to drive the car around for weeks and weeks and weeks, no problems. And then at some point it was time to go to what was the former California Speedway. And we were running on the Roval, which is the 2.8 mile course that starts out on the oval and cuts into the infield and goes around and then comes back out. And as a racer, you have to know all the flags. That's how they communicate with you. So we're doing our testing and I'm driving around and everything seems fine and I see the meatball flag. And the meatball flag is a black flag with a big orange circle in it, which is basically saying, you have something mechanically wrong with your car, even if you don't know it. So in I come, thinking everything's okay, but wondering what's going on. And uh, I get out of the car and the guys are looking at the car with me. And wouldn't you know, the rear bumper has melted completely off the car. Well, everything was fine until we got up to enough speed on the oval and the air that was swirling around underneath the chassis 
was uh, mixing with the hot exhaust and shoving it into the bumper cover and you know it melted it so certainly not advocated by toyota do not try this at home it was a quick and dirty thing that we did it seemed to be working normally we'd run straight pipes out the back if we had time or put what we call a turn down in but in this case we tried this everything was working until it wasn't and then we didn't have a bumper anymore Behold the Doubting Thomases. No, no, no. They don't believe anything you tell them about cars. Absolutely not. They don't believe you can get a real sporty car that's affordable. Then we showed them the Toyota Corolla Sport Liftback, the real sporty car that's truly affordable. Come on, how can Corolla give you so much for so little? It's just a Toyota tradition. We believe, we believe, we believe. We believe. And now, we're pleased to introduce some of the many Toyota owners from around the world who are showing their beloved automobiles here at Torque Digital. Kicking things off, we present Michael Pena's 1966 Corolla KE10. Hailing from Quezon City, the Philippines, this rare early Corolla has been restored to factory original condition. Also coming to us from across the Pacific is the 1974 Celica belonging to William Simpkins of Long Wary, Australia. Almost nothing is stock on this former track car, including its engine, a swapped 3TC. From Ojai, California, here's Sean Dana's 1987 Celica convertible. A stock restored example, Sean Celica has been in his family since new. John Marinus' 1994 Supra comes to us from Corona, California. Virtually every component on this Supra has been replaced or modified, from its top-secret wide-body kit and carbon fiber hood to its heavily built HKS 3.4-liter stroker. Modified with a different purpose in mind is Tian Yuan's 2018 Tundra. Prepared for maximum off-road deployment and enjoyment, Tian's Tundra comes to us from Garden Grove, California. Perhaps the spiritual ancestor of the Tundra, here's Jesse Hernandez's 1970 Hilux pickup. Described by Jesse as a work in progress, this Los Angeles-based Hilux sports a clean, lightly modified look. Also presenting a Hilux is Walter Nunez of Stockton, California, with his modified green 1973 model. Proud owner of this truck for eight years, Walter has replaced the interior and wheels and has lowered the suspension in classic mini truck style. Hello, my name is Walter from Stockton, California. This is my Hilux 73 with the 18RG.
We'll be back with more Torque Digital 2021 after these classic television commercials from Toyota. It may look like a sports car and move like a sports car and handle like a sports car. But the fact is, the Toyota Celica ST is an economy car. Some economy car. Toyota Celica ST. See your nearby Toyota dealer and see how much car your money can buy. You can't have Isaiah's moves. You can't have his speed. Speed, speed, speed. You can't have his style. 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 You definitely can't have his mom. Ah! But but you can have his car. His car. Car. The car. 1992 Toyota Celica. <laughs> There's a new hot one on the American road, the Toyota Corona, and the editors of Motor Trend report Corona is miles ahead of competition in performance. Delivers 90 horsepower. Twice the power you'd expect from a car this size. Goes over 90 miles an hour, corners like a sports car. And yet, most owners tell us their Corona gets more than 30 miles per gallon. This new hot one flattens the hills, passes the slow and pokey, and does zero to 60 in 16 and 7 10 seconds. Goes fast and stops fast. Large self-adjusting non-fade brakes are just one of a host of no-cost extras. The style and power-loaded Corona has everything to give you four-door family sedan comfort, even optional American-type automatic transmission. How much for the hot new Toyota Corona? Only 1714 POE. The RAV4 V6, even though it was only sold from 2006 to 2012, remains one of those vehicles that's really held fondly in RAV4 enthusiast minds and also in Toyota enthusiast minds. It led the lineup for a few years there. Um, so much so that when we were doing focus groups and customer interviews for the current generation RAV4 in 2017, people would ask us, hey, when are you bringing back the RAV4 V6? I had one or my mom had one and they, they thought it was really cool. At that time, we didn't have any plans to do a higher performance RAV4. We had the gas and we had the hybrid, which taps out about 220 horsepower. And while they're good, they don't really create that level of desirability and passion that the V6 RAV and also the RAV4 EV that we sold during about the same time period did. So as we're thinking about what the most premium RAV4 could be, we thought, how could we blend the worlds together and do a high performance version and also an electrified version that set the bar really high for the nameplate and the brand and the segment. So as we were kicking these ideas around with the chief engineer and his development team, we decided to build, to build the Kobe beef of RAV4, something that was just super desirable and would sit at the top of the lineup. So it would have been easy to do just a pure performance version, but at the same time, we also had to balance our compliance tasks with fuel economy and emissions. So we had this really big compliance burden and also wanted to push the performance envelope. And as we were looking at powertrain combinations for this vehicle, we had some that pushed the compliance lever a little bit further, had a little more EV range, a little bit less emissions. And we had some options that gave more performance, faster to zero to 60, more torque. And we chose the higher performing conditions and continued to push design and R&D to build the Kobe beef and give us more EV range. Um, and, and truly be the best of both worlds and blend that RAV EV and that RAV V6 together. And I think the product that we came up with shows really well how you can do both. You can do a new high technology compliance powertrain that doesn't have to be slow. It can be engaging and passionate. And we 
built RAV4 Prime only on our sport grades, only on SE and XSE. So the chassis tuning is there too to make it truly fun to drive and engaging. And if it weren't for Supra, RAV4 Prime would still be the fastest accelerating car in our lineup. It's a great, great way to harken back to this car behind us. Hi, my name is Rob Pia. I'm from La Puente, California, and my car is a 2011 Toyota Prius. Toyota Fest to me has been a wonderful experience meeting Toyota owners from all over the world. I first attended my first Toyota Fest in 2016, the last year at the Queen Mary, and I've been uh, going ever since. If you may remember uh, 2019, some might remember my car as a taxi cab. Uh, I had been inspired by the Japanese uh, taxi cabs and I wanted to do something fun. So Toyota Fest is really about fun, uh, making new friends, hanging out with old friends. So I brought here today my 2011 Toyota Prius. Let's check it out. So this car is my daily driver and I have in my blood, uh, I love to modify a car, so I'm gonna modify a Prius no matter what. <laughs> so I, what I did, um, some research, I was only gonna put just simple basic wheels um, and then lowering springs. And then I saw a culture in Japan um, of, of hybrid, hybrid culture. And I, I was amazed, wow, they have a, a huge aftermarket support there. Rodney was actually one of my first inspirations stateside uh, when I saw his Prius. I'll show you some of the stuff I've done throughout the years uh, with the help of friends and family, of course. Um, without them, you know, I wouldn't get it to this level. It was really a joke at first. Uh, oh, I'm going to modify this car and uh, put some wheels and Personally, I like the VIP style, so OEM plus. So my vision with this was to do a VIP style OEM plus um, Prius. Inspired by Japan, so a lot of the parts are actually Japan factory parts, spec only in Japan. Uh, with the headlights, these come off the Prius G-Sport in Japan, it's a Japan spec only. So they're LEDs with the HID headlamp my friend Sean uh, installed. And in Japan, there's a culture of USDM. So I didn't want to spend a lot of money modifying the car. Everything I wanted to do with this car, as much as possible, I wanted to make with secondhand parts. And I, I met a guy on Instagram um, who wanted to have USDM style. So I had the idea, okay, so why don't we start with trading parts? So I trade, started trading little parts like the visors and gained the trust with them. I, so I basically have his car on my car and he has my car and his car parts. With OEM Plus, I tried to choose Toyota parts. So um, Modelista is is a division of Toyota. The front lip is a Modelista kit. Uh, I kept the theme Modelista throughout the entire uh, build. Front lip and rear lip are Modelista. Stock side skirts. I tried as much as possible to get everything Japan spec. I'm just a JDM fan that way. Um, anything I could get like these um, turn signals, they light up when you walk to the car. Window visors are genuine Toyota Japan. And then any other little chrome pieces, they're either genuine Toyota or aftermarket. So I wanted just a clean, simple look. I didn't want it to look fast because these aren't really fast. <laughs> so a VIP inspired look. Um, 
Very simple, clean. Um, pinstrap is from Junction Produce. My wheels are uh, Wed's Maverick wheels, 18 by eight and a half and uh, plus 38 all around. Like the wheels are really something that makes or breaks a car. And the way I build cars is I like to Photoshop mock it. So what I did is I've Photoshopped these wheels on and, and these were the winners. Interior, um, I kept it really simple. Now with the interior I liked, I tried to find anything I could that's Toyota. So e even down to the pedals, I use an IS300 pedal with the Lexus CT200H. Big modifications here um, are the steering wheel and my head unit is actually an iPad mini which my friend Sean had uh, made a bracket and we fit, we fit the iPad mini in there and ran the wires to the auxiliary. The half seat covers we're also inspired by my Japanese build uh, with a taxi cab. I, when I had the graphics, I had all the, um, I had created it from Google Images and recreated it on, on Adobe Illustrator to, to have all the, the graphics down to the, the, the uh, little stickers here and, and, and anything related to uh, the, the taxi cabs in Japan. The back is also simple, I have the Modalista uh, lip. Everything here has a, a little Modalista uh, touch to it. I bought the, the little emblems. The Modalista tips on, on there are genuine Toyota Modalista. And the spoiler is from Aim Gain. And the antenna is also Toyota Japan. The air suspension on here is from Air Runner, uh, based in La Habra, and it's it's just the basic the basic uh, version of the the air suspension. Rodney had the super lows. Other than that. You know, a little touch of chrome here and there. Try not to overdo it. And uh, that's it. So when I built this car, I really wanted to challenge myself. Hey, I want to do something different. And uh, I saw what Rodney was doing and other Prius chat members. And so you can really make this car look awesome. And uh, it's great nowadays that I'm seeing more and more of that and I, I want to continue to see that, you know, in the coming years. So that's it. Thanks a lot for checking out my Prius and I'll see you at Toyota Fest. Forerunner is so rugged, it can take you far from civilization. Which is ironic when you consider that with its immense, well-appointed interior. Civilization is never all that far away. The all 
all-new 4Runner from Toyota. The results are in. A nationwide survey of thousands of imported car owners. A year-long testing program. And from it all, Road Test Magazine has selected Toyota Corona as... Imported Car of the Year. Before you buy your next car, look into the import picked by owners and automotive editors. Toyota Corona, imported car of the year. Behind us we have the very first Toyota sold in the United States. Now, if you think about this vehicle and study it and then look at where we are today, that's quite a journey. And it would be easy for me to sit here and say, well, we got there by enhancing production techniques, using new materials, new designs. That's all true. However, the overarching topic here that connects everything all these decades is testing. Testing and development. And did I say testing? And so let's talk a little bit about that. Let's explore this a bit. Very early on, Toyota developed test tracks. What we were trying to do is to recreate the conditions that you might find out in your daily driving, but in a track that's convenient, where we can test it under controlled circumstances and recreate natural and even some unnatural conditions. Right? That's the way to do it and be efficient about it. Think about some of the wacky roads you've driven on over the years yourselves. We create those at our test tracks as well. For example, we'll have rope roads that simulate uh, conditions on highways where you've got uneven conditions, creates a lot of booming in the vehicle. We're looking to mitigate sound in the cabin or wheel well noise. We'll have cobblestone sections. Any of you that driven, have driven on expansion plate freeways, we recreate that as well. Some of my personal favorites though involve what we call split mu testing, and that's where we have variable friction conditions on the track. How do we do this? Well, at Higashi Fuji years ago, I experienced it. We have a section of the track and some other parts that are literally paved in ceramic. And then we turn a sprinkler system on and we wet this ceramic down. And it is so slippery, you can hardly stand on it, much less drive. Then we start doing things with the vehicles. We'll start from a stop where we have half the vehicle on good friction condition, half of it on the ceramic, and we see how our traction control system works. We'll also come in from speed and come to a stop on these split and new conditions and test our ABS brake systems. Some of the most enjoyable testing though is when you're on a solid section of this track that's ceramic and wet, and then you start doing turns to try to look for skid, either oversteer or understeer conditions, and see how our vehicle stability control programming reacts. Some of our better systems that I've seen in recent years, the only time I could really cause them to fail was if I pulled the parking brake and defeated them mechanically. They're that good. So in the end, this testing and development combined with materials improvements and the like really has netted us the awesome products we have today. Presenting the new Toyota Supra and Dan Gurney. It takes the right stuff to make a great performance car. Come ride with Dan Gurney and see. It's quick off the line and the power just keeps coming on. That's the twin cam six cylinder fuel injected engine talking. Now let's see the independent four wheel suspension in action. Very nice, handles well. The big tires and rack and pinion steering have a lot to do with that. And it also performs inside. Take a look at this wraparound sports seat and the convenience of having everything where you can see it or touch it. But the new Supra has much more. It has heart. It has the right stuff. Nice brakes. The all-new Toyota Celica Supra. That's the right stuff. Oh, 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 what a feeling. Supra. Toyota. The Toyota 2000 GT is arguably the most desirable of all classic Japanese cars, and with a total production run of only 351 examples, ownership of this timeless classic puts one in a very elite club. One member of this club is our special guest, Craig Zinn. 
Hi, I'm Craig Zinn, and welcome to the Toy Room. Behind me you see nearly a dozen Toyota 2000 GTs, many of which I'm the second owner. It's an honor to have you here today and share with you my passion for the incredible Toyota 2000 GT, and as a young boy, my father becoming the first Toyota dealer in Florida and seeing this incredible James Bond car uh, come to fruition. I'd like to show you each and every one of the cards, but right now I'm just been given a few minutes to say you're always welcome to come here in beautiful Hollywood, Florida and see this incredible collection of Toyotas. Not only are there 2000 GTs here, but there's an RT53 over there and an FJ40 over here. And uh, what's that, a 75 Celica Pace car. So when it comes to uh, Toyota and Craig Zinn, there's nothing that I love more than sharing my passion for this incredible brand. So welcome and thank you to all the Toyota owners and restorers and uh, hope you have fun. Thank you. So today, Toyota North America benefits with products that were engineered and designed and developed here in the United States. However, this was not always the case. If you want to rewind the clock a few years here, now what you're going to look at are vehicles that were coming from Japan that were designed and engineered in Japan. And that would result in the occasional uh, product feature that maybe was not quite applicable to the U.S. market. So the company decided to make some changes. They initiated the process by requiring engineering teams that were designing products and engineering products for the U.S. market to come over here and spend a lot of time in the United States testing. We called that Genji Genbutsu, which means go look, go see, you know, go try your products out in the United States. However, we still had occasions where we missed out on opportunities to capitalize on some features that might have been perhaps better for our market. Uh, for example, the location of your electrical plug for towing, right? In Japan, they don't tow much. So we sometimes would miss that uh, chance to have that plug located in a more opportunistic location. So it was still decided, you know, more needs to happen at this point. We need to do more than that. So there was a milestone here less than 10 years ago, right, where we had our first North American based chief engineer. We had design studios in California and other locations pop up. And what that gets Toyota is a better targeted product that better fits the North American market. For those who believe hood ornaments make a statement about quality, Toyota presents our newest ones, the J.D. Power and Associates Awards for Initial Quality. This year, three Toyotas were ranked best in their price class. Five more ranked best compact or full-size vehicle. In total, eight Toyotas were ranked best by their owners, more than any manufacturer in the history of these awards. Toyota quality, it's the most powerful statement we can make.
My name is Rodney Esteban. I am from Lakewood, California, and I have a 2010 Toyota Prius. Since 2005, I've been involved with Toyota Fest with my 2004 Scion. And then now with my 2010 Prius, we've been with Toyota Fest since that time. In 2004, I participated in my first Toyota Fest event uh, with a 2004 Scion XB. Uh, since that time, I have now a 2010 Prius and we continue to be an active member and participant at Toyota Fest. We're very excited to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Toyota Fest this year. Uh, behind me is a 2010 Toyota Prius that I have been working on for over 10 years now. Uh, it has been modified uh, beyond your typical Prius. It's not your typical grandfather's Prius, as you can see. It has an air suspension, audio system, full interior leather. And as you can see, it is uh, something that you don't uh, see with over 5 million hybrids worldwide. I chose the Prius as my next vehicle to modify because the alternative fuel vehicle needed a disruption. It needed a new vision of how this car can be accepted into the mainstream. Unlike your typical grandparents vehicle, I wanted to so show something that was totally different for Generation X, Generation Y, Millennials, and Generation Z. So as you can see here, there are many things that uh, I saw in Japan uh, which they already had a following. And I wanted to bring some of those products here to the United States. As you can see, SSR wheels, I am running the 19 by nine SSR Reiner type 12s. Uh, that is an all around size fitment for this vehicle, uh, just enough clearance so that it tucks nicely in the wheel well. The body kit that I have on here is also a part from Japan by Mode Parfum. Uh, this is a full replacement bumper for the front and the rear, as well as the side skirts. If we go into the back, the Mode Parfum product line continues with the dual, dual exhaust, fully functioning. Uh, I also installed it rear fog lamps. And up on top, you can see the rear cargo box, uh, especially from Eno Racks USA. Uh, that cargo box, uh, you can open up on both sides uh, and it has a nice aerodynamic design which flows very well with the current Prius design here. Continuing in the vehicle, I have an Air Runner air suspension for this car. It is a specific air suspension uh, for this particular vehicle. Uh, there are two suspensions available. This one is the super low uh, air suspension by Air Runner. Many of the parts you see also are Toyota JDM parts, which they sell in Japan, uh, such as the originally equipped window visors here. And if you come over here, this is also a Toyota original parked in Japan. This is the side winkers as well as the puddle lights underneath. Also a really good feature in Japan is the headlamp eyelids. This is a Toyota specific part uh, that we brought over here as well. As we continue to the interior of the vehicle, what we did was, is we wanted to do a full leather repra replacement so the interior leather is from Roadwire Leather Interiors. Uh, we did a two-tone tuxedo style with the top part being a white leather and the sides and the back being black. Okay, so you can see on the interior as well, we did a, also in the interior, you can see we did a wood grain. This is the burl wood interior, as you will see in most Lexus vehicles. Uh, Inside, you can see the Audison uh, audio system controller, which controls the power base audio system in the back. With over 40 years of owning Toyotas in our family, 
Toyota has always been a symbol of tradition for us, and we are very much excited to celebrate 25 years of Toyota Fest here in Southern California, and uh, we'll be there. We'll see you there. So when you look at the development of Toyota products, often we have to compromise in any given product to balance performance and fuel efficiency. Those tend to be opposed in their goals. The challenge for today's Corolla sedan when it was being developed was put to the chief engineer in simple terms. We want this car to be more efficient and we want it to be faster and fun to drive. So how did we go about doing that without having to compromise? How do we give our Corolla owners everything they want? But well, what we did is we took the Corolla sedan and we broke it out into grades, some that were efficient and some that were more fun. So let's get into this and see how we did it. One of the things we did on the efficient side was to lighten the car's weight anywhere we could in any components that we could do this and maintain good reliability, okay? So on the efficiency side, we cut vehicle weight on the engine, transmission, anything like that, electronics, wherever we could. The other thing we did is we used our 1.8 liter Valvematic engine, which used to be available on the previous gen, and it's very efficient and offered a slight horsepower gain. We mated that to a CVT transmission. So that sounds pretty good on the efficient side. However, customers, some owners may have concerns with the performance of a CVT. Is it gonna feel too rubbery at launch? So now let's transition to the fun side of the family, right? We went to a 2.0 liter engine. Our dynamic force engine bumped us up 30 horsepower. We mated that still to a CVT transmission, but a more sporty designed one that had a true first gear and the ability to reduce that rubbery feeling gets you solid launches for excitement. And then of course, the real enthusiastic drivers could pick a manual transmission, right? Beyond that though, then the vehicles, all of them got an independent rear suspension, which enhanced handling across the board. Now, this suspension, though great for handling, cost us some weight. But remember, we lost weight in this car in a lot of areas by shaving weight off those other components. So in the end, the weight gain was nullified. We gained the weight back with that suspension, but now we have Corolla sedans today that are very efficient, running the 1.8 liter engine and its drive line. And we have some very, very fun Corollas running our dynamic force 2.0 liter engine. And then of course behind us here, we have the Corolla hatchback also running that two liter engine and all the fun transmissions and a great drive line and suspension as well to add that to the fun side of the family. So is there a compromise? I say no. I think in the end, a Corolla buyer can get the Corolla that they choose, whether they want a really high efficiency model or one that has a high fun quotient. My wife can't understand why I don't sell it. After all, we agreed we would when we bought the new one. But every time I look at Dad's old Corolla, I remember the first time he brought it home. I'll never forget it. Well, what do you think? He was so proud. He said, these, these cars, cars are, are built, built to last. last. And he was right. Now, how do you put a price tag on a memory like that? The Toyota Corolla, over 15 million happy memories and still counting. Sell Dad's Corolla. I love you, Dad. I love you, too. Sure, I'll sell it. For about a million bucks. This is ESP from Toyota. It's an electronic sensing panel that comes with the solid new Corona hardtops. Here's how it works. 
electronic sensors reach out to monitor 11 key service areas of your car. ESP is designed to tell you when a tail light is burned out, or a headlight, even in the daytime, or if your battery needs water, or if you need oil in your engine, or water in your radiator, or if you need washer fluid for your windshield, or if your front disc brake pads need replacing. In all, ESP monitors 11 key service areas to take some of the worry out of driving. ESP, another innovation from Toyota, small car specialists for 40 years. Here are more great cars brought to you by Torque Digital. From Asahikawa, Japan, here's Sasaki Masahiko's 1984 Corona hardtop. A rare sight even in its native homeland, Sasaki is the second owner of this original Survivor Corona. Ryan Panlilio's 1974 Celica is a largely stock appearing resto, but underneath, a 5-speed swap, MR2 steering rack, and T3 coilovers add to the driving excitement. Ryan sends us his Celica from Pleasant Hill, California. This 1982 High Ace, owned by Henning Dirkelboten of Nestun, Norway, was formerly a fire engine in a small Norwegian town, and has traveled less than 15,000 kilometers since new. Russell Vardman's 1991 Supra has been in his family since new. Now showing only 91,000 miles on its odometer, Russell's original unrestored Supra makes its home in Van Nuys, California. The Philippines' tradition of high-performance Toyotas is alive and well with Robert Tan's supercharged 2010 Yaris coming to us from Pasay City. Its modifications include extensive use of carbon fiber components. Finally, here's Sebastian Saldana's 2004 Celica GTS, coming to us from Stockton, California. It features modifications practically from bumper to bumper, including comprehensive body customization. Hello, my name is Sebastian Saldana, and this is my 2004 Toyota Celica GTS.
This is no ordinary housewife. This is no ordinary car. This is the new hot one, Toyota Corona, the family size fun sedan. And this is Lee Breedlove. Lee Breedlove holds the woman's land speed record, over 300 miles an hour at the Bonneville Salt Flats. And she knows cars. She likes Toyota's optional automatic transmission. Sports car performance, 90 horsepower, zero to 60 in 16 seconds flat. The handy turn signals on the horn ring, 30 miles a gallon economy, clean lines of design, 47 extras, and low, low price that makes Toyota Corona the car you can't pass up. Toyota feeling, the fun of a sports car without the torture. Traditionally, sports cars have been somewhat inconvenient and somewhat temperamental, but suffer no more for the sake of fun. The Toyota Celica Supra. Talk about comfort, air conditioning, and a lot more is standard. And six fuel-injected cylinders deliver power with Toyota efficiency. The Celica Supra. Oh, So how was the Corolla hatches hatch hatched? It's an interesting story and it covers an aspect of design versus production engineering. So the talented designers at Toyota came up with the great design that you see behind me today. The challenge was on the production side. How do we try to stamp that rear hatch out of metal and have it look good? Well, reality was that to stamp that hatch out of metal was virtually impossible. So now Toyota had a choice. Do we go the route of many of our competitors and change the design and make it more simple and stamp it out of metal? Or to maintain our styling flair, in this case, we decided to mold this hatch out of resin and then use a metal subframe to, to stiffen it up. So what we get there is a no compromise design look to the car. And oh, by the way, the hatch is lighter than a metal version of that hatch. And as we know, light makes right in vehicle performance. My name is uh, Santos Renovales, uh, but everybody call me Santos Turbo. Uh, I live here in uh, Los Angeles, uh, Hawthorne area. I've been living here for 25 years. Uh, this is my son, Nicolas. I'm Nicolas Renovales, and I've been living here ever since I'm I was born. I'm 23 years old, so basically since he's lived in this house, I've lived right with him since I was a baby. and. And this is my 1974 Toyota Corolla. So basically when I was uh, not about nine, 10 years old, I've always been into the Toyota Corolla, specifically the T27s, the coupes. And I always looking on Craigslist, eBay, wherever they sell cars, you know, just putting 1971 Corolla, 1972 Corolla, 1973 Corolla, just, just to see what pops up. And one day, one day on Craigslist, it was for, the San Francisco, the Bay Area, because I just looking up and down California, you know, just looking just for fun. And I came across this car, you know, 1974 Toyota Corolla SR5. But I didn't know what SR5 was. I just knew it was a Toyota Corolla because I know how the body looks. And I showed my dad, and I'm like, hey, look it, it's a 1974 Toyota Corolla. It looks with the flares and all that, you know. And I showed him, and he's like, that's an SR5. That's not no normal Toyota Corolla. That's a real deal SR5. Toyota Corolla and you know from there you know from there he's like we have to get that car you know I've been looking for this car ever since before you were born they're hard to find hard to find Corollas and you know he made a deal with me that when we got the car he's like hey 
I'm, I'm already older, but you're still young, you know, and I'm gonna build this car for you. But the deal is that you have to get all A's in high school and you have to go to college and graduate. And so this past summer, June 2020, I graduated from the University of California, Irvine with a Bachelor of, a bachelor of Arts degree in criminal justice and psychology. And yeah. Yes, sir, that was the best deal I ever made <laughs> because, you know, my kid went to, to school, made all A's and he went to college. And that's all I want, you know, even that I love that car, I want that car for me. Well, he was 10 years old and that came to my mind. I say, I'm gonna make a deal. I'm gonna get this car. I'm gonna build it together with him, join him how to build cars and make him go to school. And everything worked perfect. Now he loves his car. He graduated from college, made me happy. So we are Corolla family, like they say. We love Corollas, Corolla rules, yes. Torque is just about being in an environment and community with people, like-minded individuals, you know, and, you know, maybe I'm not into Coronas or whatever, but just seeing all the different Toyotas and varieties that exist, you know, and being able to see the cars too, even from Japan, you know, that we might not otherwise see without Torque, you know, so Torque is just a great place that brings like-minded individuals and everybody that not only likes Toyotas, but loves cars too, you know. Young people like me prob probably most likely wouldn't be as much into the cars, you know, so it gives a venue for everybody from not all, not just California, but from across the country to come and gather and look at all these Toyotas, you know, and that's why I've been going as long as I can remember. Look, at, Torque is on its 25th and I'm 23, so imagine we've been going since single digits, you know, and look at how far we've gotten. So I thank them too for giving young people like myself, my sister and others, to come and get into the cars, you know? This is my daughter, Vanessa, and she owned the 1980 Corolla. It's over there, you guys are gonna see her later. She also is into cars, she loves cars. We put together the blue Corolla, same, same way that we did Nicholas and me with his car, mm. we did the blue one, so that car is belong to her. So, you know, that's what I would like to see other families helping their own kids to to learn about old school and the, the beauty of the Japanese cars because all of them are beautiful. Ever since like I seen my dad do all the cars, you know, when I was a kid, I seen all my father's friends come in with Datsun, Corolla, Nissan, whatever. They came, they were always here. So I was always immersed in Japanese classic cars. So growing up, I was always with my dad, whether it was at the car shows, the, the racetrack, wherever. And so seeing my dad with his Toyota Corolla going down the track, growing up, I was like, man, I want that to be me. I want to race too. Of course, now that I'm older, like, you know, my interests change and I don't, I don't quite want to race anymore, but I wanted to have the same car as my father. I always wanted to be like my father. So that's why the 1980 Corolla really fits my personality and my interests. And so it was thanks to my dad that, you know, me and him worked on it together. No, 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 Adrenaline. <laughs> you know me. I'm talking about me. I, I inside the car, you know, and mm -hmm. I just want to beat the light. Okay. That's what all in my oh, mind. Okay. Because oh, drag racing uh -huh. is about reaction time. You know, you, you can even race a car that is faster than yours, uh -huh. but if you got it out the hole. Uh -huh. So this is a 1974 Toyota Corolla SR5, but we, we changed the front, so we put the 73 front with the round lights and small bumpers, because you know, we love that. That's that's our favorite, the small bumpers and round lights, and you know, 73 in USA, only one year with the round lights, so everybody wants the round lights. So I've always wanted a 73, so that's why I put it, because my dad, before this car, he had another 1973 Corolla. It wasn't SR5, but it was a regular, same thing, style, coupe, T27, and he sold that car, and you know, it happened to be orange too, and I really loved that car, and I was really sad about when he sold that car, so that's kind of the backdrop and backstory and inspiration for why we have this car now, you know, because he knows too I was really sad and down about that car, so that's why, that's why this one is, you know, where it is now, you know, and a lot of the elements and style comes from that previous car that we sold. Here we have the Villa Specialties 15 by three and a half, you know, five, and we convert the axles to we convert it to five lugs, you know, with GTS brakes and, you know, drilled and slotted 
drill to slide and and then you have the SR right here. This is the this is from a 73, but we convert it, you know, to make it look like a 73. And you have metal flares right here. And you have the right here you have the red line for the black seats, real poster. And then we have the we have right here the the wood the wood console, you know, with the tachometer. And then in the back we have uh, 245. 225, 45, 15. You know, we like like drag racing style, you know, so we have skinny in the front and, re and fat in the back, you know, almost like a race car. So that's another, that's a, one of my favorite parts about the car is is the, f the skinny in the front and, and fat in the rear, you know, cause out here in the West Coast, you don't see too many cars with that style, you know, and that's kind of representative of my culture, you know, where we come from Puerto Rico. So over there, we like, over there, we like the cars like this style, you know. So that represents us. So under the hood is a 3TC turbo. So the motor's from a 1980 Toyota Corolla. And the bottom end is well built. You know, Arius pistons, chromoly powder rods, and you know, CT26 turbo from a Supra. And you know, nothing special, you know. We made 250 on the dyno at 16 pounds. And you know, it's just a nice little cruiser on the street, you know, running on pump gas, 91, you know, so, you know, you step you step on the on the pedal and whoosh, you know, the, you feel the boost, you know, so, 3TC rules, you know, that's, this is where it's at, you know, old school. So I, so I just want to give a special message to my dad, Santos, because, you know, without him, this wouldn't exist, you know, and part of like what, my day-to-day -day living, you know, is immersed in all the cars, you know, without the cars, you know, it, it, I, I find it hard to picture what a hobby outside of the cars would look like, you know, so I want to thank my dad for, you know, building this Toyota with me, you know. Start, starting point was torque, you know, and just going to the shows and seeing other people's cars, you know, and you dream and you see and you're like, wow, I want to have one, I want to build a car like that, you know, my style, you know, so maybe maybe when I come to the show then I can inspire another generation of kids and students to you know follow in the footsteps you know and announcing Toyota's million dollar dash for the 1980 Olympic Games you got it for you, participating Toyota dealers have a sweepstakes with a million dollars in prizes. For the athletes, one million dollars to train now. Toyota and your Toyota dealer will make a donation for the U.S. Olympic team with every new Toyota sold through June 30th. The Million Dollar Dash. Enter sweepstakes at participating dealers. You don't have to buy a thing. It's a barbecue, it's a raft, it's the kids. This looks like a job for Toyota Wonder Wagon. The 1987 Wonder Wagon, able to carry cargo and up to seven people in a single trip. Able to switch to four-wheel drive. Able to turn on a dime. Even able to make ice. If your wagon can't do this, it may be a job for Toyota Wonder Wagon. So when Toyota goes to produce a new product, the first thing that has to happen, number one, is we have to design the product, decide how big it is, what it looks like, how it feels. Once the design is settled upon though, now the challenging work begins. We have to produce this vehicle. So one of the first things that happens on the production side is a production engineering group will analyze every task that needs to be performed via robot or human to produce this product. Any tasks that are deemed potentially exhausting to the workers per se, or perhaps dangerous, will then be set aside and then analyzed. And in some cases, Toyota will simply change the design of a product a bit to make it easier to assemble. Here's an example. At our Toyota Tundra plant in San Antonio, we started building the new full-size Tundra pickup back in the fall of 2006. And what they had were truck frames going along the assembly line and the plant team members then had to bolt on the suspension components underneath this frame. This very be quickly became apparent that this was a difficult and challenging task and also not the most efficient way to do it. However, it did take some thinking 
and some plant team member meetings, but they developed a machine that would flip the truck frames upside down and allow the team members to get in there very easily and efficiently to put their components on the bottom or underside of these frames. It sped things up, it was easier on the workers, that was great for everybody. Then later in the line, the machine would flip that frame back to right side up for the addition of the upper components. And one final thing I'll leave you with is that at a Toyota production plant for vehicles, any plant team member, and I mean any plant team member, no matter what their station, has the ability to pull an and on cord. And if they pull that cord, it stops the production line and generates an immediate response from supervisory and management personnel to look into the issue that the team member is then going to report, thus ensuring that we have a great level of quality at our Toyota production plants. Thanks again to all who participated in Toyota Fest's 25th anniversary show, and also in Torque Digital. And thank you for watching our day one coverage. There's more to come tomorrow. See you then.